Hey guys, welcome to Table Talk 4. This is part of our Table Talk initiative, where we are wading into challenging conversations together as a family of believers. Sometimes these topics are, are quite polarized. And so the attempt here is to understand the, some common ground and some mutual understanding and some deep listening. In the context of a divided American church, we are seeking a, a unity that is not uniformity, a, a Trinitarian sense of things where we can be diverse and together at the same time and our opinions and our theologies and our way that we carry out our faith. And that's the experiment of Table Talks. It's a space of conversation, a space of hope and healing and Christ's love where we pursue God in meaningful and often challenging and often polarizing conversations. So if you're unfamiliar with this initiative, check out our initial three Table Talks. Table Talks 1 and 2 are kind of foundational to this whole project, so I, I recommend you visiting our page archive and diving in. And if you've been with us for all of these, fantastic. We're diving into a topic today called Church and Power. Now, let's go ahead and define our terms a little bit. What are we talking about here with church and power? A lot of the cultural issues that we face today are inherently political. In other words, we feel that as our Christian duty, as our, our way of loving neighbor, that we want to see things uh, in the world and society uh, changed. And so, inherently, these questions come back to our relationship with power. This can be political power, it can be cultural power, it can be other forms of influence. All of us operate out of what we believe is a right relationship between the church and these channels of power and influence. And that's what I want to talk about in this study session video. And this will frame our discussion as we hear from one another where we land on this kind of spectrum of things and realize, hopefully, some common ground in this conversation that can be a bit polarizing, to say the least. In order to dive in, I wanted to actually illustrate that the kind of camps that we can associate with are actually historical. It's been a long conversation. The, the early church wrestled with this question about what to do with political and cultural power on a formal scale. And so we're going to dive into history for a bit. author and origin of our faith, Jesus Christ, was King of King, Lord of Lords, but he died crucified on a tree in the Roman eyes as a criminal, as an insurrectionist, in the Jewish eyes as someone who had blasphemed. He had a great deal of power, but how did he use his power? Was that formalized? Was it authoritative? Uh, was it was it person to person? Was it corporate? Uh, what kind of power did Jesus wield? And the church over time has, has reinterpreted different ways of, in, of seeing the, the power of Jesus, and they've come up with different answers on this. So we're going to explore some historical touchstones today. One is Eusebius, who was writing in the early 300s, and another, uh, we're going to look at a, a figure named Simeon the Stylite, who is a fascinating figure uh, as we look at the monastic movement in the early 400s. So bear with me. I think you'll find some familiar contours in their arguments and their thinking and their relationship uh, that they see between church and power. Let's take a look at Eusebius first. We might call his perspective empire. That we're going to highlight what I believe to be unhealthy relationships with power in public life. You may know some about the origin story of Christianity in the early church history. In the 300s, uh, an emperor named Constantine ended up taking on the Christian faith. And when an emperor took on the faith, it actually became the state religion of Rome. And a guy named Eusebius, a church historian, enshrined this story in his own uh, ecclesiastical history, the history of the church. As we're going to see out the gate, this history 
unfortunately, is a bit of a propaganda piece, in my opinion. All right, so let me quote from uh, Eusebius's version of Constantine's uh, coming to faith and how it affected the whole relationship of the church to power. Eusebius is telling the story, and here's how the emperor told it to him. And while he was thus praying with fervent entreaty, a most marvelous sign appeared to him from heaven, the account of which it might have been hard to believe had it been related by any other person. But since the victorious emperor himself long afterwards declared it to the writer of this history, when he was honored with his acquaintance and society and confirmed his statement by an oath, who could hesitate to accredit the relation? especially since the testimony of after time has established its truth. He said that about noon, when the day was already beginning to decline, he saw with his own eyes the trophy of a cross of light in the heavens above the sun and bearing the inscription, conquer by this. So what is going on here? Constantine is saying that he had a vision that <laughs> it's interesting because because Eusebius pads a lot of a lot of his explanation on why he's following this. But in a vision, he believes he saw a cross that said conquered by this. So this is an explicit relationship with the church and power. Constantine feels he's being given divine permission to use his full stately power as a Roman emperor at the service of the cross to conquer by it, to conquer by the cross. Is anybody a little nervous about this perspective, this relationship between the church and power? Is anybody a little worried about the make disciples of all nations and that you'll be known by love and all these things that Jesus said his church would be known by? Is anybody a little nervous that people will be conquering with the tip of a sword in the name of Jesus Christ? Let's have Eusebius' take. Thus the emperor in all his actions honored God, the controller of all things, and exercised an unwearied oversight over his churches. And God requited him by subduing all barbarous nations under his feet, so that he was able everywhere to raise trophies over his enemies. And he proclaimed him as conqueror to all humankind, and made him a terror to all his adversaries, not indeed that this was his natural character since he was rather the meekest and gentlest and most benevolent of men. So he's the most terrible conqueror and he's somehow also the, the most gentle one. That's why I said this is a propaganda piece. Come on, you guys hear the problem here. The Roman emperor is claiming that God made him uh, kind of over all of the earth. Does anybody think that there's an unhealthy relationship between church and power here? I would argue yes, I believe there is, and I think Eusebius is forging this doctrine of Christian empire that is absolutely cancerous to the church as we fast forward through Western history and we see the wake of this. Let me take it right to the cutting analysis of Mark Charles and Sung Chan Ra and their book on the doctrine of discovery. Here we go. The idea of Christendom, an earthly Christian empire, is an extra-biblical concept that is not aligned with the teachings of Jesus. A convert to Christianity would join a community of believers as an act of submission to the kingdom of God, knowing full well that their conversion would result in carrying a cross. With the advent of Christendom under Constantine, admission into the kingdom became entangled with participation in protection from an earthly empire. Instead of joining the church intentionally, sacrificially, and in opposition to empire, membership in the church now depended upon citizenship in and allegiance to one of the most powerful and historically oppressive empires in the world. Do you understand what observation they're making here? If you fast forward through the, the, the thrust of the Roman Empire, Guys, it is, a, it is a legacy of dehumanization. It is a legacy of land theft. This, this concept of Christendom gets imported into the European church culture and it shapes American history because, uh, you know, land uninhabited by Christian kingdoms were, was free for the taking. In other words, the people there weren't fully human unless they were, they were one to the allegiance of the empire. This is a cancerous idea. This is a toxic relationship between church and political power. 
And I hope you see that, that this, this is not a good way to view things. It, 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 it's, it's part of this spectrum. This is when the church fully and uncritically embraces all political power, all cultural power that it has access to. It's an unfiltered relationship between the church and the state. This is what results, a, an oppressive system that has characterized much of Western history. So empire is not a healthy relationship between church and power. I, I know what we should do. We should, we should not take up the cause of the empire. We should just flee from all power, from all influence and, and say, anathema, I don't want political power. Let's remove ourselves from the world. Well, that's exactly what happened in the monastic movement. Let's look at another unhealthy relationship with power in public life. We can call this one absence. So some key figures in this, the monastic movement in response to this newly adopted, hey, if you're Roman, you're Christian, it's our state religion. Um, you know, the em emperor is kind of our, 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 our dude. There was a sense by some of these devoted Christians who had, who had relieved that the persecution was over, but they felt that there was something insincere about assuming that everybody Roman is Christian. And they saw a deeper relationship with God and they went to the desert. We call these the monastics. And this movement happened as a response to Constantinianism. It was in the church before, but it really kicked off on a larger scale when the church adopted political power, adopted all of its cultural influence through Constantinianism, through this empire. And they fled away from the empire in order to pursue their faith more seriously. I think a fun example is uh, the memorable figure, Simeon the Stylite. Now, to be fair, I'm gonna highlight this guy and what he did, but I do wanna say he actually wrote letters um, that, that was suggesting that the, the, the Christian empire should have persecuted the Jews even more. So I, I don't think he falls cleanly in the absence camp in terms of his thinking of his relationship with political power, but ostensibly he, in my mind, represents this thrust away from the empire. What did he do with himself? He removed himself from, from, from the, the field of influence so much <laughs> that, that he climbed up a pillar and lived there for, what, 37 years or something like that. So let's read about this guy. So this is from Wilkins' History of the Church. At an early date in Christian history, men and women withdrew from the fixed patterns of society to devote themselves to prayer, to service to God. By creating an alternate social structure within the church, they laid the foundations for one of the most enduring Christian institutions, monasticism. It was not until the fourth century, however, that monasticism comes clearly into view. And when it does, it seems to have sprung up spontaneously in different, though similar forms in various parts of the Christian world. The time was ripe. The church was growing rapidly and inevitably earlier ideals were lowered or compromised. The new movement renewed the radical demands of the gospel and put new models of a holy life before the faithful. Continuing on here, Syria produced one of the most bizarre and unforgettable figures in early Christian history, Simeon the Stylite. After living in a monastery northeast of Antioch for 10 years, Simeon asked permission to go out on his own, to live out in the open on the crest of a hill. Later, he mounted a small pillar and perched himself at its top, suspended as it were between heaven and earth, with his hands outstretched in prayer. Over the years, the pillar grew taller and taller until at his death, it was reported to be more than 20 feet high. Monasticism was a way of life that thrived on solitude and seclusion. So guys, uh, though we could pick apart his actual relationship with the church and state, this guy is a patron saint of removing yourself, removing yourself so far that you're not even in a, 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 a monastery cell or a, a commune. You're not even with people. You're so removed that you climb up a pillar and people like, had a pulley that, that had his food and and I think his waist came down the, the pulley too. I hope they were different baskets. Anyway, you get the idea. 
this is a this is a poster child for what it looks like to respond to what is the relationship between church and power church and and political influence church and state let's let's not take up any of it let's absolve our power let's remove ourselves because the potential for the the political power to corrupt us is so high that we're going to remove ourselves away from society to live in an alternative society to be removed from the world so that we can think clearly about God. Now, does anybody have any hard time with this perspective on church and power? Let's continue on here. The monks had their critics both within the church and without. Pagans considered the monastic life a vile and disgraceful profession, heaping abuse on the monks for their coarseness, lack of learning, and misanthropy. They considered them rustics, vapid men who were anti-city and anti-culture, who packed themselves into caves to avoid life in society. So just as we got nervous about the propaganda tendency of Eusebius, who wanted to uncritically put Christianity inside the glove of empire and fully willed it, thinking that it wouldn't compromise the message of Christ. On the other hand, we have someone throwing away political power, and here's the accusation. Are they anti-society? Are they misanthropists? Because they're so removed from the world, do they really care about it? Is this the program of Jesus? Cutting analysis from James Davison Hunter in his wonderful book I highly recommend on this topic called To Change the World. It explores different threads in the American church on this relationship between church and influence of cultural power, of political power. And here's the accusation against this kind of thread, this kind of absence mentality. Not empire, but absence. Here's an indictment. The pietistic and perfectionist tendencies are in large part the source of their separatist tendencies, a strategy of withdrawal, tribalism, and therefore political irrelevance. How much could Simeon the Stylite really change the world from atop his pillar? When Christians remove themselves from society to create their own alternative society, does the world really experience the embodied message and love and, and, and the seeking of shalom that's to come with the good news. Hunter, and I would argue, this is problematic. This is an unhealthy relationship with church and power. Absence from all power and influence in the world is not a good idea for people who want to change it. People who are to follow their Lord and loving it. We're stuck between the poles here. Are the only options empire with corrupting entrenchment or absence without meaningful involvement? There's some dangers to empire. We all see those. And there's some dangers to absence. We all see those. Are empire and absence still among us today here in the American context, here in our own church culture, in our time? Yes, indeed, these familiar threads are at work. So Constantinianism is alive and well today, and we might follow that thread all the way to Christian nationalism. As you know, January 6, 2021, there was a group of Christians that attempted, Christians and non-Christians to be fair, but there were a group of Christians who attempted to take the capital. They wanted to put on the glove of the American project and all of its political arms in order to bring about kingdom agenda. I think it's safe to say that that kind of extremism is not quite the cause of Jesus. I think it's safe to say that that empire is not the full answer to what is our relationship to power as a church. Likewise, the familiar thread of monasticism is still alive today. Monasticism, as rich of a tradition as it's offered us, there is alive this withdrawal tendency that is really kind of baked into the the American church expressions, the Anabaptists and the Neo-Anabaptists. They're still around today. There are people and tendencies that remove themselves from, from public life altogether as to not influence the world around them and really to be concerned with their own alternative society. It's not a comprehensive answer to change the world. So if we're stuck between empire and absence and the dangers of each of these, how do we mediate these? There are some good things about empire to actually use uh, all the power we have at our disposal, or at least some of it, 
to make the world a better place. Isn't that a good aim? And yet, Jesus calls to be in the world, but not of it. And, and there is something distinctly alternative about the life of Christ in the Christian community. So shouldn't that stand on its own, uh, that, that we need to have a, a sense of withdrawal or alien otherness about us? Shouldn't we have that quality? And this is the case we're trying to make in this table talk, that we actually need nuance in the relationship between church and power. And so we explore a third way, an alternative power in political life. We might call this embassy. Between empire and absence, can we envision a meaningful involvement without corrupting entrenchment? This is the challenge of embassy, and it's a biblical one. So let's explore this thread throughout the Bible. We can reference some key touchstones here. As Paul, as Peter, as other writers throughout scripture attempt to address the Christian relationship with the state, we feel some tension and we need to acknowledge it. So let's dive in and take a look at this and see if we can hear some of the competing uh, frameworks because that's what we're gonna need. If the, the scriptures are ambiguous or there is tension or there is some contradiction or there is, let's just use the word nuance, then we also need a nuanced relationship between church and power. So 1 Timothy 2, verse one through four. First, I tell you to pray for all people. Ask God for the things people need and be thankful to him. You should pray for kings and for all who have authority. Pray for the leaders so that we can have quiet and peaceful lives, lives full of worship and respect for God. This is good and it pleases God our Savior. God wants all people to be saved and he wants everyone to know the truth. So Paul is saying our gospel strategy depends on our support of the kings through prayer, the authorities, the, let me translate, the powers of the world. We, that there's some sense of meaningful support and maybe even partnership with them through prayer. And yet, in his letter to the Ephesians, this circular letter that addressed some problems in the area of Ephesus, we get a bit of a more adversarial picture. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Rulers are good. Rulers are bad. Which is it? We need them. And they're also maligned. Do you hear the tension? We need as much nuance as Paul does in our relationship to political power. Peter writes to address this as well. Obey the people who have authority in this world. Do this for the Lord. Obey the king who is the highest authority and obey the leaders who are sent by the king. They are sent to punish those who do wrong and to praise those who do right. So when you do good, you stop foolish people from saying stupid things about you. This is what God wants. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. Live as servants of God. Show respect for all people. Love the brothers and sisters of God's family. Respect God, honor the king. So this alternative order, but we actually participate in obedience to the political powers, but we have our own things going on too, this kind of absence perspective. Like we've got some stuff going on that we need to attend to. And, and it's kind of this alternative. And then First Thessalonians 4, 11 through 12, and make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and to work with your hands, just as we told you, so that daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. There's a sense of independence, a sense of quiet life, this removal sense. Do you get the, the, the layers here where it relates to the world around us? Christians can't uniformly say we need to seek all the power we can and hoard it for ourselves and use it for the kingdom. And, and it also doesn't say... Uh, to totally remove yourself and be detached from the, the political powers of the day. There's a nuanced relationship here that's going to involve prayer, that's going to involve distinction, that's going to involve uh, even opposition, right? So we need to, to nuance our view of our relationship between the church and power. And that's what we want to do. So let's press forward and explore this option, this third way, this alternative relationship to power in public life that we call embassy. I do want to credit Hauerwas and Willeman for this phrase, resident alien. They actually land pretty, pretty firmly in the absence camp. 
But as you'll see, that's not how I'm using it here, but resident aliens. Right? Uh, repping the King Jesus. That's it. We are ambassadors. We are in an embassy. Well, let's explore this notion as it unfolds through scripture through the use of key words that are related to the message we bear the gospel if we attend to these nuances. We are getting some clues about how to engage the world around us. What is our relationship with power? Let's go back to 1 Peter. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, Peter, really good at this, bringing in the, the Gentile believers, writing to a group in Asia Minor. He's telling them that the story, the historical story of the Jews, the salvation history that we see throughout the Old Testament is actually the story we're invited into. He uses a phrase from an earlier stage in Israel's history where they're engaging the world as exiles. This is really cool because we actually have advice from God through the pen of Jeremiah about how to engage the world as exiles. If we're exiles, what does that mean for our relationship to power? Does that mean we take all that we can? Or does that mean we remove ourselves altogether? Hmm. Let's listen to Jeremiah. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they may too have sons and daughters. Increase in number there and do not decrease. Let me stop there. Is this the absence camp? Somewhat, right? Uh, do the thing that God wants you to do, to be fruitful, to multiply, uh, to settle down, to plant gardens, to, to, to continue the cultural project, the cultural mandate of Genesis uh, 1 and 2. Do this this kind of like alternative reality kind of thing. Do it there vibrantly, but there's more. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Guys, that's a political engagement strategy. That uh, is seeking the peace, that the, the, the Hebrew word there underneath that's shalom. And shalom is this concept of wholeness. And this is talking about addressing societal brokenness. This is a comprehensive aim. And it's going to involve them getting their hands dirty in Babylon. It's going to involve them fully participating in these exilic communities as foreigners, as exiles. So they're not building their kingdom. They're not building their own alternative kingdom. They're not enforcing their kingdom upon other people, but they're improving the kingdom around them. And that's going to be an embassy for God. Some of the elements of empire are here. Engage. Some of the absence of, of absence are here. Be different. Be separate. And they're both true somehow in this exilic strategy to engage the world around them. This exilic strategy of church and power. Not convinced. Okay, maybe the exilic model isn't enough. Let me illustrate that the, the very message that we attach ourselves to as Christians, the gospel, the good news, it actually comes in the language of diplomacy. Uh, so it's kind of baked into the linguistic world of, of the identity of the church that they were operating as an embassy, as ambassadors for the Lord in a foreign context. So let's go with Apostle. I've got BDAG, it's a lexicon, so when you hear me say that, that's what's going on here. Apostle, it means delegate, envoy, messenger. Uh, the NIBD, which is the New Interpreter's Bible Dictionary, as a general designation of someone authorized to act on behalf of another or sent with a commission, and as a distinctive title for particular founding figures and church leaders. Guys, think of this. The apostles were delegates, messengers, envoys. They were guests. They were resident aliens advocating for a kingdom that was not fully here yet. And so they're not to, to take over this kingdom. They're to advocate for the, their kingdom in another kingdom. Does that make sense? Let's move on. Let's go to kingdom. The word basileia uh, in Greek, BDAG has kingship, royal power, royal rule, the royal reign of God. Uh, in IBD says, Jesus made God's kingdom the center of his preaching and programmatic activity. This is an engagement strategy. What are we about? There is power claims involved in the good news. We serve a king of kings. We can't just go to nowhere and think that our message is so irrelevant and so individualized that we remove ourselves from society and have no sense of engagement. We can't do that. This is a kingdom message. And it does come to challenge the authorities and the powers of this dark world. 
That's true. So we've got to pick up some sense of power in the message of Jesus. It will change the world around us. We're advocating for this. The, the very claim, Jesus is Lord, Kyrios, uh, it's, it's named for, for Yahweh in the Old Testament as well. It's also a seditious claim. So let me read here the New Testament slogan of faith, Jesus is Lord, was a seditious pledge of new allegiance. In Roman political theology, the emperor was Lord. This is not a politically neutral message. And for those of us, like myself, I'll, I'll tell you where I am on this spectrum, uh, like myself who, who kind of have a neo-anabaptist thread, I'd rather just let's, let the church be the church. And p politics is too messy for me. I don't want to get involved. Guys, it, there is a, a truth and a, and a political claim here that, that the message of the gospel is inherently politically subversive. We have to realize that. We have to embrace it. And it's built into the very good news we bring. But we don't come uh, to, to, to uncritically uh, put our hand uh, in the glove of, of empire. We're ambassadors. And ambassadors need diplomacy. Uh, corrective here perhaps to those who would rather just remove themselves from society. We need to meaningfully be involved, but a corrective here for those who want to take on as much political power and will as possible, to, uh, maybe if you have a Christian nationalist bent, uh, we're ambassadors. Uh, we're not coming here with a flag to claim. Uh, we're here as diplomats of another kingdom. Okay, so, praise Betho, uh, to be an ambassador, envoy, travel, work as an ambassador, a mediatorial role. Okay, the NIBD says New Testament writers employ the term figuratively. They are ambassadors of Christ, carrying his message throughout the world, often delivering it in chains, aka from prison. So, guys, we've got to engage the world around us. And we have to do it in a way that is not like the world around us. Do you hear a corrective there to either camp? Do you hear this nuanced view, this embassy view of things? There's a lot of wiggle room on how we be an embassy. So, so let's keep this paradigm going. What does it look like to be resident aliens repping the kingdom of God? What does it look like to be a Christian embassy? Not an empire, not absence, but embassy. Church, church family, my brothers and sisters. What does this look like? Let's talk about it. And, and maybe to help you get there, I want to close on some reflection questions. What does it look like to seek the shalom of our places? What does active engagement look like without becoming entrenched in power? How has the church sought power inappropriately? How has the church absolved power inappropriately? So what I'd love for you to do is pause that, go back, pause that slide, and journal these things. Bring this, let the conversation continue to roll. Bring these up in prayer. Talk about them at your dinner table. And may the conversation of table talk already begin, because these are the kind of things we want to explore together. This is so important. It's so foundational that we realize the tensions here, that we understand that we're, we're maybe we're coming from diff different dispositions. There are some of us in, in our church family, who operate more, uh, understand, sympathize with more of the empire. Uh, they believe cult Christians should pick up cultural influence. And there are some of us who believe Christians should put it all down. And we come from these different places on this spectrum. And I hope you hear that each one can learn from one another because we need nuance. And if you're not totally sold on the need for nuance, let me just exit with this reflection. Maybe this will help bridge this from the theoretical to the historical and the real. And, and maybe it'll help you understand the dilemma and seek nuance in your own relationship with the church and power. Look at these historical scenarios and think through them. If you are someone who tends towards empire, and what I mean by that is that you think the church should use as much political and cultural power as it has access to to accomplish the, the things of the kingdom. I want to give you a cautionary tale. Do you remember the Crusades? You've read those histories. This is the danger, and there's many more examples, of a time when the church uncritically took on political power, um, weapons and machinery of war to accomplish something they felt like was a kingdom aim uh, that ultimately was this dark spot on the history of the church. Don't you think we need a nuanced relationship? Don't you think that empire isn't quite the answer? 
reflect on the Crusades a bit. If you tend to believe the church should seek more and more power. For those of us who perhaps lean toward absence, who would rather see the church put down its power, recede from public life and live as an alternative community without engaging itself in the tricky and challenging world of politics and cultural influence. Another cautionary tale for you. This is the civil rights movement in the 60s. If you were present in the 60s, would you engage? Would you advocate for those who had been historically oppressed? Would you be anti-segregation? Would you get your hands involved in protests and politics in, in cultural influence strategies to advocate for your neighbor of color? Would, would, would you do that? So I say this as a cautionary tale to those who trend towards absence because there are meaningful ways to become engaged in politics that the, the world desperately needs the church's voice and prophetic uh, calling into. And, and we need to, to, to use those cultural and, and political influences in order to make the world a better place for those around us. So I hope you see the need for nuance. This conversation we hope to be foundational. Table Talk 4 is a bit of a platform, a foundation stone that we can build off different topics. And inherently, we're going to encounter some predispositions toward this. We want the Table Talks, we want our church family to be a gracious space where people in different perspectives and different associations with power can find common ground with someone across their, their theological spectrum aisle. And, and we want to realize that we can have so much to learn from one another when we have this conversation. So as this foundation stone helps us to wade into issues, we want to realize that much of our engagement strategy is shaped by presuppositions that are dealt with in this table talk, our relationship with power. So guys, I can't wait for the table talk conversation. I can't wait for that event night. In the meantime, after you've reflected on this stuff, I'd like you to take the influence audit. It's the spiritual practice for this table talk video series. And I think you'll have uh, an eye opening time identifying the ways that you can influence the world around you, the dangers of that and the opportunities of it. So may we as a church family realize the dangers and the opportunities of our relationship to power. And may God use us as ambassadors for his kingdom in the here and now. And until kingdom come, Godspeed.